Welcome to our webinar. <laughs> Uh, I always say like we should have like an intro song or something like that, kind of like a TV show where it makes it more interesting because these are super boring. A lot of times I've joined these and I'm like, oh man, this guy is painful. So we'll try to make this as entertaining as possible because you're giving us an hour of your time. We're going to give you entertainment and some value. Um, so today, obviously, we're talking about everything specific around retention marketing, obviously, more specifically around email marketing, SMS. We're going to talk about basically how we implement these things for sellers of all different sizes, six, seven and eight figure sellers, what we've implemented, what we've seen that they've implemented and basically all relevant. And we're going to go through the whole process from the very beginning, which includes like the crazy, weird technical stuff all the way up to campaigns and design and that kind of thing. So without further ado, we shall begin here. I am Andrew Maffetone. I am the founder and CEO here at Blue Tusker. And then I have with me my lovely content marketing manager, Hannah. Hannah, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Yay, Hannah. <laughs> Hannah's my favorite out of everyone. If anyone is joining from the team, I don't know what to tell you. Well, thank you for Dead that. quiet. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah, ha Hannah handles all of our, not only all of our copy, but she also handles the entire retention marketing side of our business. So she is, she's going to know this better than I do. However, I'm having an energy drink, so I might talk a lot more. And then she's going to tell me to shut up so that she can actually be, tell you the real effect. <laughs> um, Today, what we're going to talk about. So right in the beginning here, we're going to get through all the technical stuff. There's a lot of technical things that need to happen uh, prior to anything that you do from an email marketing perspective. And it is hands down, number one, the only thing that I always find that no one has ever done. They never look into this. They don't know about all the like different stuff you got to set up in your server and all that. So I'm going to show you that. We'll go through the uh, classic stuff like audience segmentation. Uh, all of the different, like how you can set up emails from a conversion driven standpoint, all of the different flows that you can possibly think of. And a handful of them, we're actually going to walk you through exactly how to set those up as well. Uh, we'll go through campaign calendars and how you should map out your cadence on how often you should be sending campaigns, all of the AB testing strategies, um, examples on how you can actually grow your list from there so that obviously everything else that you did that I mentioned prior to that can be improved. And we're going to go through all the conversion focused aspects of this as well. And a little bit of housekeeping for you up on the right hand side here, you'll see a little chat option as well as a QA and a option. I will attempt to check both of them, but usually better you just keep it in the chat. If you got any questions, comments, concerns, feel free to put them in the chat there. Everyone that I see you're starting to come in here. I thank you all for telling us where you're from. That's always very interesting. And it's kind of stereotypical and that's sweet. Um, but just so you know, everyone who is here at the end, I am going to give everyone our retention marketing strategy as well as our weekly uh, data tracking spreadsheet that we use. Um, it will help you map out your entire calendar and campaign as well as tracking the results for your campaigns as well as your automated flows. And at the end, we're going to give away two free full email marketing audits that Hannah herself and her team are going to implement for you. Right, Hannah? Correct. <laughs> So, I love this one. This is going to be fun. Why are you here? Because you're smart. You know that you're looking to increase your ROI and obviously retain your customers. You work so hard. You pay so much money to keep your customer acquisition cost as low as possible. And the easiest way to keep that customer acquisition cost really low or tolerate a higher customer acquisition cost is by increasing the LTV of your customer. So, that's what all this is going to be about how you can kind of squeeze that extra dollar out of all your customers. They're not here right now, so hopefully they won't be offended by that comment. Um, but obviously, if you're tired of the increasing cost for, uh, customer acquisition costs and you are looking for new ways to drive different conversions or you're looking to utilize uh, these more low-cost engagements, obviously, everyone here probably already knows the number one KPI in pretty much every e-commerce business is sales, profit, et cetera, money. The second most important thing is your email list. How cheap can you get an email that is basically tied to your customer acquisition cost, which we'll chat a little bit, chat a little bit about as well. Um, and we're also going to walk you through how all these seven and eight figure sellers we work with, how they're expanding their LTV from their customers and making sure that they continue to come back and enjoy their experience. We're going to chat about that. Uh, but 
real quick, just so we can get a little bit of insight from everyone, I'm going to start a quick poll here. I am very curious. Uh, there we go. Uh, let us know what percent of your revenue is currently driven from email and or SMS marketing. So basically your existing uh, retention marketing efforts. Very interested to know um, basically where you currently stand. If you don't know, then don't answer it. Um, but we're going to figure out just so I can kind of make sure we guide this in the right direction, but super interested. Uh, and so everyone here knows it is completely dependent on where your brand is at the time. Some of them, as obviously we're starting to see, can be up to 50%. I've seen some get into the 75% range. The average tends to be in like that 10 to 20% range, but it kind of depends on obviously your business and your brand and your uh, product line, etc. cetera. Um, but... While I leave that poll up, because it looks like we're kind of even right now, uh, we're going to get started on all the fun stuff. Ready to do this? Let's do it. So, how is this just like owning a car, Hannah? <laughs> well, as someone that doesn't know a lot about cars, <laughs> um, a lot of it has to do with just routine optimization. So when you are buying a car, obviously you don't just stop doing work on your car. Like you don't not get an oil change, not get gas, not do tune-ups, things like that. And email marketing honestly works the same way. So just because you start an automated series doesn't mean that you never have to touch that automated series again. Just because you create a list doesn't mean that you don't always need to optimize that list or find different ways to break out that list from the original one that you created. Um, same thing with campaign cadence, emails, things like that. So there's always optimizations that can be done based off of, first of all, you know, conversion driving behavior. So what your end goal is, but then furthermore to finding different ways that you can connect with your customers um, to either become a thought leader in the space, um, you know, educate or whatever your end goal or secondary goal is, you know, you want to make sure that you're targeting your messaging to the right people at the right time. And so that's, really important just like owning a car beautiful so let's let's attempt to stick to the car analogy this entire time so i'm gonna go through the technical stuff right like what's in the engine so we're gonna go through everything that is specific before you even start sending anything this is the one thing i know i mentioned this earlier like no one does this i don't know why this is the most obvious thing this is what is very clear helps you with your deliverability so there's ways of like verifying your domain etc so you have your dkim you have your dmark you have your spf we have domain verification, and now Google's also implementing uh, this whole verified trademark thing on Google. So your DKIM, your DMARC, and your SPF, here's what I can tell you. All super important. You basically have to take some information and then put it into your C name for wherever you have your domain owned. It's kind of like your way of verifying that you own the domain and that the emails you are sending out are from there. There are some very technical specifics around it that I don't have a developer joining us today to explain it to you. But what I can tell you is it takes like 30 minutes to get it done. You can get a code. There's a ton of different uh, platforms out there that will actually help create this for you, which we'll talk about them too in a second here. They'll create the DMARC code that you need, DCAM, the SPF. It basically gives you C name information and you can input it to wherever you have your domain, like GoDaddy or Bluehost or wherever you have that kind of stuff. And then domain verification, which is verifying through Google. So you can see up on the top left here um, how Google's got that little blue check mark. You might see that some emails coming in to your uh, inbox now have this little blue check mark. And so basically what this whole process is, is a verification from Google. So it's kind of like, you know, if you get one on Instagram or Facebook or something like that, they're verifying that they can confirm that you are the business that you are claiming to be. So it can help reducing, obviously, of, of anything going into spam. It can obviously improve the overall... Um, What's the, uh, like, what's the word I want? Uh, like awareness, I guess you could say, of your brand. Um, and then from here, really what you have to do is you have to get your trademark done. So if you already have your trademark, you're in a good spot. You can submit it to Google. Google reviews it. Once Google approves it, you get a blue check mark. And then that is another way to stay out of the spam box. And all of this can severely help improve your deliverability, especially through Gmail, and especially with all the different iOS changes that happen that kind of have limitations on what works and what doesn't. So this is a little bit of extra information around it. It does obviously help authenticate the overall domain. It helps completely reduce the spam side of things so that you're not getting stuck in someone's spam box whenever it's time for you to launch a campaign. There's 
a lot of information around like the pass and fail of domains. Uh, it notifies in the moment if there's an error, so you can actually get some information if there's some issues going on. Uh, and then obviously overall your email marketing metrics will start to improve simply from an open rate side of things. And obviously if you're doing uh, your AB testing, all of your CTAs and all of your design, et cetera, it will help from a click through rate as well. Uh, these are the ones that we tend to use, <clears throat> test a few of them, but easy DMARC, um, Glock apps and DMARCly. So each of these can uh, review and tell you basically is it set up is it not set up is it broken are you getting put in a spam box are you getting uh blacklisted somewhere are you whitelisted somewhere uh are you having an issue with your yeah are you getting stuck in spam what's the deliverability of all of the different places you're getting put in so all of this helps you start to monitor some of the technical aspects of it and several of them or all three of them i should say will actually give you the information of generating the DMARC and the DCAM, the SPF and that kind of stuff. So they'll make the code for you, you throw it into your domain and then you're good to go. Um, the trademark thing. So this is done through Google. And this is, as I mentioned, kind of you, you supply them with a trademark, you kind of have to give them a little bit more information about the business. And then what it does is it actually verifies you as the person sending it. So you get the, uh, the little blue check mark. I can guarantee you for the foreseeable future, you will not end up in a spam box if you go through this step, at least through Gmail, because they can now verify you are who you are and you're in a good spot. Now, if you start to send a bunch of really shitty emails and then a bunch of people start spamming you, I can't promise you that. But Google will definitely make sure that if you're sending an email and you have proven you are who you are, you will be in a good spot and start to send these. This was a, it, we changed out the name, but this was an, an example of someone obviously over at Amazon that I was speaking to that gave us some of this information. Google, obviously, you saw in here, they have it. Um, we're working on doing ours. We've already submitted for it. Just waiting for Google to finish it. Um, so it can severely help reduce bounce rates. It's really, really easy. It's not a complicated thing to get done. You just have to get your trademark done. And if you don't have your trademark done, that takes a while to get done. Um, but otherwise, highly, highly recommend doing this. So all of these different things I just touched on will definitely help from a deliverability standpoint. Then you have the segmentation side of things. So this is what we referred to as your non-negotiable segments to utilize. So Hannah, I know you loved this one because you were like, oh no, you're doing these whether you want to do them or not, which is why we referred to these as non-negotiable. Because in reality, I agree, everyone should have these. Uh, so you want to tell us a little bit about these? Yeah, so when you are sending out emails to your audience, segmentation is obviously critical, you know? And so, but, Depending on the messaging that you're sending, it's very important that you either have the right inclusions or also the right exclusions as well. So engage 90 days. I like to think of these as your fan favorites. So these are the people that have either purchased, opened, clicked an email or all three within the last 90 days, especially, you know, if they're multiple times as well. Um, and these are the people that, you know, they're either keeping an eye, they're like more frequent purchasers or something about your content. They're always engaged with, they're always opening. Um, and so you always want to continue to target these people regardless, um, just because they're going to open it. And on a more selfish front, it'll boost your metrics. But then two, you're staying front of mind with them, you know, to obviously uh, boost sales, boost engagement, anything like that. Um, your VIPs, kind of similar, but VIP is just taking that a step further. So VIP, I usually like to break out based off of the amount of money that they've spent with you. So you could either break it out depending on your business by, you know, their lifetime value over, over a certain duration or how many purchases that they've made, um, over a span. So an example would be if they've spent $500 overall with you, or if they've made five or more purchases, depending on obviously average, um, average spend, things like that. But these I'd like to put in a separate bucket, especially for like campaigns and stuff. You obviously want to include them because they've spent the most money with you and they're the most loyal to you. But then too, if you've got, um, you know, campaigns or early access, things like that, you kind of want to throw them, throw them a bone. So from this perspective, if let's just say, um, Q4, you're doing a black Friday sale, 
VIPs should technically get that discount first, you know, just because again, they're they're your day ones, they're they're the most loyal to you. And so you're giving them a little bit more of an exclusive access as well as the general campaign as well. But yeah, the potential purchasers, um, these are people that are engaged with your emails, but they haven't purchased. So um, you can refer to these as window shoppers, or maybe they've purchased a while ago, but they haven't purchased again recently, maybe within like the last six months, depending on the product service that you're offering. But from that perspective, you want to target to them a little bit more on the sales focus. So from this perspective, if you've got um, a big sale that you want to provide to them or an additional discount code outside, you know, just things like that where you can incentivize them a little bit more just to get them on the hook, you know, because obviously they're engaging with your campaigns, but it's not enough to drive it home. So you want to be able to target that a little bit further. And then the last two there is going to be your exclusions. So anyone that's unengaged, if they haven't opened or clicked an email in a while, probably because they're just not interested. Um, and then also the bounce. So the bounce kind of similar to what Andrew had talked about with spam and things like that. If it's not reaching them, it does, you know, it's only going to hurt your deliverability. It's only going to hurt your metrics. And so with the unengaged, you can definitely work on getting them into a sunset flow. Or if you want to just send an email directly to the unengaged to see if you can get them to re-engage with your um, subject lines or things like that. But from a campaign status, if they're not biting, it, it doesn't really pay to continuously, you know, push them. So beautiful. Mm -hmm. And a quick note for everyone up on the left hand side here, you'll see some of the examples of the segments that we created. We're Clavio partners, so we, we use Clavio throughout this whole thing, but we also do MailChimp and Active Campaign and uh, Countless, HubSpot. There's a billion of them. They're all done the same way. This will just show you exactly like what kind of parameters we put in place. I also know that no matter how big we made this, it was very complicated to read. So if anyone wants the slides at the end of this, just shoot me an email. Uh, I'll email everyone some stuff at the end of this anyway. Let me know. I'll send you the slides so you have um, Some of the additional segments too that we talked about. So the product-based stuff, you have the demographic specific stuff. You have the window shopper, which you talked about a little bit. We have the likeness to purchase, the, the likeliness to purchase and the organization side of things. So the product one I really like, if you want to get that specific in certain brands, certain situations, maybe you have something that's a subscription. Maybe you have something that needs to get repurchased every now and then. Um, from a demographics uh, example, actually specific to the demographic side, I'll give you an example here. We work with someone who does a lot of like NFL and NHL and NCAA and products and that kind of stuff. So we've got them split out by every single team. So that way, when we're sending emails, they're only seeing creative and copy, et cetera, from the teams that they like. So there's a lot of information that you can change out and personalize your emails just by having a lot of these different segmentations in place. And from a product perspective, you can actually start to figure out exactly how to go through and make sure that you're showing them either the product that they liked the most or category specific based on the product that they selected. Um, Mario, happy to send you the uh, slides after his. Uh, just shoot me an email, I'll get to you. Uh, yeah, there you go. yeah, organization side too, the B2B side, the B2C side. For those of you that also may have a B2B, whether it's wholesale or, I don't know why I said it like that, wholesale, wholesale. <laughs> whether it's wholesale or whether it's just traditional DVC or something like that. So that way you can be able to segment them out and obviously personalize from there or just email them directly about whatever it is you have going on. Um, but the automated flows. Okay. So with this, before we even get into these, very similar to this and this, there's a ton of these screenshots. We're going to show you exactly how to set these up. Uh, and there's obviously some design examples. Again, if you want the slides, just like Mario asked, just shoot me an email. I will get them over to you. Um, we're going to go through all of our favorite ones here. And then I'm going to also do a list of a ton of other ones you should think of. Some of these are very basic. Some of them are not. Uh, so we'll get a little bit deep into these. Hannah, would you like to kick us off with the welcome series? Sure. Um, so yeah, so the welcome series, probably one of the best known ones. Um, and so the big thing that I like about the welcome series, and I think one thing that's important to add is obviously, you know, conversion driving behaviors. But two, I think the welcome series is a great way to establish trust between your brand and then your users as well or your customers. So 
the way that I like to think about the welcome series and how we've utilized it um, is pretty much kind of like a way to introduce yourself. So depending on how they come in, so that you give them their discount, they get the 10% off for signing up. But then beyond that, in that series, respectively between two to five, depending on your brand, your business, you wanna take that time to share a little bit more about your brand, about your business, and kind of like a get to know us. So, you know, your story, if you're a little bit smaller, um, you can also go into, you know, your mission, you know, things like that, where you can establish a little bit more of that, that trust. Um, so from like a copy standpoint, it should be a little bit more softer and friendlier. Um, and then overall the flow dur duration, I would say one to two weeks, depending on how many emails you have going on, but it's kind of, um, just a way to, again, not to repeat myself, but really just establish that trust between you and that customer. So that way they can get to know a little bit more about you as you're trying to get more information from them. Yeah. It's a great way to explain the business. It's also a great way to explain what they should expect in their inbox, because sometimes people just send these welcome series and it's like, Hey, here's some information about our business. And then like, that's it. You really should continue with at least several other emails. I, I don't usually suggest doing welcome series with like 10, 15 emails in them because if you're doing campaigns on a regular cadence, which we'll touch on later, you don't want to overlap too much. So with the welcome series, you really just want to let them know about what they should expect and welcoming them to the campaigns that you should be expecting as time goes on. And in some cases, those campaigns, there's a billion other examples of stuff we can get through, which we'll get to on that as well. Um, but yeah, great way to introduce the brand. I'll fly through a couple of these. Um, thank you series. Really straightforward. I love these. We find these to do really well. They, and by really well, I'm referring to open rate, theoretically, in some cases, click rate. I actually don't use these for conversion focused. I use it for more engagement focus to make sure that they're actually opening emails and engaging with them because if they're interested in them and they do open them, they're going to continue to open up the ones in the future. So this one is a way to really try to connect with that customer. If they've uh, purchased you for once, then you really want to send them like a thank you for choosing to shop with you. Getting someone to buy from a new place is a lot harder than getting them to repeat purchase. So when they buy for the first time, you really want to personally thank them. In a couple of the examples here, the way that we wanted to position some of these brands, they're very traditional, like, hey, here's a nice looking marketing email, thanking you, blah, blah. Another way to do this, if you have a more personalized brand and you're maybe you're, you choose to be the face of your business, you can actually do this as a more like written email, like a, as if you were to email the customer yourself, personally thanking them for shopping with you. And then you can also set this up for a repeat purchase. I'm also a fan of doing it at least one more time. So when they purchase with you again, that means that they enjoyed their uh, shopping with you so much the first time they chose to come back. And that is where you really start to see the customers that stay with you for a while. So if you do now the next one, which is essentially thanking them for coming back, you're starting to realize like, okay, maybe I can get them to stick around longer. So you want to thank them again. Maybe that time you might want to give them a discount as a thank you for coming back or something. Some brands discounting is great. Some brands not. That always depends as well. Band and cart, super straightforward. Um, I actually don't really like giving a discount on abandoned carts for the first email. Um, sometimes people just are like, oh, I'm going to come back later and do it. So an hour after they abandon the cart, maybe two or three hours later, just let them know. Be like, hey, just letting you know, you forgot something in your cart. Here's some great information about it. Here's some reviews just to kind of push them over the edge and see what happens. Then maybe 12 hours, 24 hours after they abandon the cart, then maybe you want to explore giving them a discount. Try not to jump to doing discounts all the time. Um, at least in my opinion, but abandoned cart, right place, right time. I mean, this one's clear cut. Uh, I would really hope that pretty much everyone on this call already has that set up because it's standard. All these are standard, but friggin' um, sunset series, very underutilized, yep. right? Hannah, we never see this one very often. Mm -hmm. Um, I love this one. It's how do I explain this as an agency we try to point at all of the best metrics. So, hey, your open rate's doing really well, or your click rate's doing well, or you're getting good revenue from all your emails, blah, blah. But when we suggest putting in a sunset series, they go, oh, well, the reason your open rate's so good is because you got rid of everyone who wasn't opening your email. True, but also false, because 
if you have a ton of people in your list that are getting emails and they're not opening them for an extended period of time, let's say six months or something like that, then you probably don't want to be emailing them anymore because if you have a low open rate or you have a low click rate or you end up getting a ton of deliverability issues or something like that, that will affect your overall list. So the people that are actually engaged might actually start to see your email less often. So it's the concept of a sunset series is to wait X amount of time and put something in place where they haven't visited your website, they haven't opened an email, they haven't purchased anything, they haven't done anything in however long. You usually have to pull out that data and kind of get an understanding of how long that is. Then you let them know, be like, hey, we haven't seen you in a while. Um, make it very clear in the subject line, make it very clear in the copy. We haven't seen you. Or, uh, if you're still interested in getting these emails, please click here and then just send them to the homepage or something. And then maybe. 10 to 14 ish days later, you send it again. And then if they still don't do it, you can have it automatically unsubscribe them so that you stop sending to them. If they haven't opened an email of yours in let's say six months and you're sending anywhere between four to 10 emails a month and they still haven't opened any of them, they're not gonna. So just get rid of them and let them clear it out because it'll improve all your other emails. Win back, Hannah, you wanna take this one? Yeah. So um, WinBack is really good for obviously re-engagement. Um, and similar to what Andrew had mes uh, mentioned too, um, you can obviously utilize discounts possibly where, where, the, where you see fit. But the main focus here is obviously just going to be retargeting and trying to obviously get that re-engagement back with that WinBack. Some um, clients or you know customers prefer or businesses prefer to do it like right after um like an extended period of time with no um engagement or purchase others you can do it depending on the product right after they do a purchase and kind of just getting them to add on a little bit more um it's kind of based off of what your business is what you're selling and kind of what it is that you're looking for um, but the main approach here is obviously going to be very targeted usually the use of a lot of dynamic um images so obviously whatever you know you're trying to target them towards so a certain page a certain collection having additional options below but it's really going to be cta heavy so you really want to drive them at some point just to get to a shopping page of your website and just getting them to look through things and kind of sparking that that interest again yeah and then you can explore giving them a discount on that second one usually this is the one where i also suggest like make it pretty personalized they're maybe they're still engaged maybe they're still interested usually like so we mentioned the sunset one you know let's say six months go by or whatever this one depends on the brand obviously but maybe it's three or four months since they last purchased from you so this is kind of like the between the sunset and their first purchase sort of thing and this one i really like personalizing it of like hey it's been a while since you shopped with us here's some more stuff similar to what you were interested in because that's why they originally came to you um, but it's a great way to try to get them to actually come back. Maybe they just forgot about you. Who knows? Hopefully that's not the case, but it's a great way to get them to come back. Best customer. I like this one. This one's really fun to play with because uh, there's a million things you could do. I like this to really only be sent to like, you could refer to as like a VIP customer. Someone that has made X amount of orders and or spent X amount of money with you. And you automatically send them something saying, hey, you're one of our best customers. Here's a quick thank you for you. Here's X percent off. Here's X money towards your next order. Uh, maybe it's a personalized email from you as the founder. Maybe it's uh, adding them into some VIP list where you're like, hey, we're going to let you know about new products before anyone else. Something to make them feel really special and feel like, oh, it's a good thing that I've spent so much money with your business. Then there's all the other ones, right? <clears throat> Those are the basic ones where like, these should probably be set up no matter what. But then you've got, what do we got here? Birthday flow, get mm -hmm. their birthday, automatically trigger something for their birthday when it's coming around. Sometimes what you can do is maybe in the welcome series or something, when they sign up, have an additional email, be like a survey that asks them like, oh, let us know when your birthday is and let us know about your anniversary or something. And then we'll send you a thank you on that one. Uh, in some cases we've done a uh, graduation. Like when did you graduate? Every year that you graduated from a certain place we'll send you. So there's a ton of different direction you go with that. Um, application flows. 
What am I thinking? Yeah, so like if someone fills out like an application on the website for like oh. lead flow generation. Yep. <laughs> gotcha. Yes. So if you've got, yeah, I'm with you now. So like <laughs> uh, wholesale applications or something like mm -hmm. that for someone to sign up to be able to purchase from you from a wholesale perspective. Thank you. Good point. I was like, why? I'm drawing a blank. Um, price drops are a big one. If you can set up a price drop alert on your site, that one works great. Back in stock is a fantastic one for those of you that go in and out of stock all the time. Um, transactional stuff. So you have your basic ones, right? Your order confirmation, shipping confirmation, all that fun stuff. Just make them pretty at least. Obviously make sure they're getting their information. There's some stuff out there where you can actually have a plugin and it will, the email will change itself and say like when they should expect their delivery. You can set that kind of stuff up, but all the transactional stuff, for those of you that are maybe on Shopify, yeah, they come preloaded. Yeah, they're getting emails, but they're hideous. So go make them nice and pretty at least and make them branded for you. <laughs> Plus you could actually add additional stuff in there. You could add discounts and alerts and all that kind of thing. Uh, browser abandonment, they came to your website, but did nothing. So maybe one of your other emails got them to come to your site, but nothing else happened there. So that's a great one to set up. Um, kind of like an abandoned cart, but they didn't make it that far. You have your pop-up slash like discount. So if they obviously submitted for a pop-up on your site or anything along those lines, make sure they send it that way. The bounce back is very interesting. So the bounce back I've seen work very well for like apparel brands, um, you know, t-shirt shoes, that kind of stuff. Sometimes in the beauty area, I've seen it do pretty well. It kind of depends on the, the approach you're taking, but the bounce back is essentially, literally you're trying to get them to bounce back and make another purchase. So it's basically like they make a purchase, you usually wait like 24 hours, and then you give them their own custom coupon that only lasts 24, 48, 72 hours with some ridiculous discount where it's like, okay, that's about as high as you wanna go and see what you can do to get them to come back immediately and make a second purchase. I've seen those work really well, um, especially if it's kind of like a, hey, we've got a secret thing for you. This is only for you and it's only gonna last so long. Upsell, cross-sell, very straightforward. Someone buys one thing and they should actually upgrade and buy something else, or maybe they should buy an accessory that comes with it, anything like that. There's a lot of uh, businesses we work with where they purchase something and it's something that needs to be re repeat purchased. So like water filters and things like that. So what you can do is when someone buys something for the first time and it's something that really they should consider putting on a subscription, you can immediately send them an upsell of like, hey, sign up now for the subscription and get X percent off your second order or something like that. Uh, replenishment. Same thing, if they just choose not to subscribe, at least send them a reminder like, hey, your water filter is up or whatever else it is you're selling that might need to get repeat purchased. And then of course your review requests, um, which Clavio is releasing their own reviews now too, by the way. I don't know, we didn't have this, I didn't have that prepped ready for it because I know it's like completely new. Um, but for those of you that might be using Yapo or Trustpilot or something like those, they've obviously got those all set up in there too. And there's so many others. I mean, we, I was talking, uh, Hannah and I were talking before the webinar today about uh, someone who's doing free samples and then that's a whole drip campaign you can do. I mean, there is basically, you gotta think, as soon as someone takes any action on your website, any action at all, you can trigger something. So it's all about what data are you getting and then what can you, what message can you send based on what they just did? So that's how you start personalizing it and developing all these additional flows. Did I miss anything there? No, I think you got it all. Good? Beautiful. Let's go. Uh, you want to start? You want to kick us off on SMS? Yeah. So SMS is actually probably one of my favorites um, just because I think it's so fun. And there's a lot of um, cool ways that you can go about it just from not only a creative and copy perspective, but then also now from like a segmentation perspective as well. Um, so biggest thing with SMS marketing is regulatory compliance. So with most platforms, this will already be built in. And then also too, if you have either um, a two-step, you know, or a footer where you wanna have people subscribe, um, a lot of that will already kind of be in the fine print, but just making sure that one, you're just checking it regularly, especially if you're running SMS to make sure that, you know, like the spam, the GDPR, especially if you're um, sending text messages um, internationally, that's going to be huge. So just making sure that you're complying with that. Um, but SMS is really great because you can obviously personalize just like you can with email. 
can use a lot of playful standout copy. Um, it has to be really short, depending on a lot of like the characters and SMSs that you're sending um, and what's deemed as an SMS based off of how you're being charged, depending on the platforms that you're being used. Um, a good, I would say, benchmark for sending would be no more than four months because it is so personal. Sending an email, most people expect it. They, not everyone gets emails or alerts that they're getting an email, but a lot of people do have their alerts on for SMSs. So you want to make sure that whatever SMS that you're sending, it's kind of got a purpose to it. So whether that be early access for something, a big discount for something, a launch, that you're at least notifying and you're sending it with intention. And then two, you can also do SMS flows. So you can hook that up to your welcome series, your abandoned cart, which is really um, nice too, depending on if they are obviously subscribed to that. Um, but typically for SMSs, if you are running them in addition to your campaigns, it's always best practice to do a little bit of a higher offer than you are with emails, just because you are getting a more personalized access to that customer. I got another poll for you. <clears throat> Um, so now we're going to get into campaign cadence. And as we get into Q4, this is where it gets sticky because you don't want to send an SMS or an email campaign 500 times in one day. I, uh, I'm a big cigar guy. I like cigars. Not, not a lot. Yeah. Not a lot. Like it's like, uh, I would say one every weekend would be probably pushing it a lot. So I would say maybe one or two a month, right? But golf, got to have my cigar. I signed up for this cigar. Uh, I don't want to say the name in case this gets put on YouTube and it, they send up seeing it. But I signed up for this cigar company. And I'm not lying when I tell you I got like four or five emails a day. Oh, wow. It was ridiculous. I was like, I'm never shopping with you again just because of how poorly you're doing this. Uh, so you got the poll up there. Let us know how often you're sending out email campaigns. Um, but now we're going to get into the cadence. I love this one. This is this is very interesting. So we're going to talk about creating a campaign calendar. Uh, actually, you know what? Hannah, I know this is your forte. You want to take this one too? Sure. I know you're very excited about it, but I'll take it over gladly. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so when you are setting up, um, obviously, your campaigns, typically, especially with quarter four rolling around, we always like to do at least three months in advance, but we understand that obviously sometimes with sales and changes and, you know, things are never solid in business, naturally. So we know that sometimes all you can do is just a month in advance, but having something visually mapped out is extremely helpful. I know that Clavio um, does templates. We obviously do templates as well, or even just creating your own and just mapping out one, the sale, and then two, how, how frequently you wanna communicate with your customers about that sale and the channels that you wanna hit them with as well. So a big thing um, with that too is, you know, utilizing based off of segmentation is huge as well. So kind of like what we spoke about earlier, your VIPs. So if your sale starts on the 15th of the month, do you want to hit your VIPs early access or your SMS early access on the 14th and then give them, you know, two days where they can get the, the sale first? You know, your potential purchasers, are they going to get are they going to get different emails versus your engaged 90? You know, kind of establishing out who you're going to contact when and then what that messaging is going to look like. And then also it'll just help to from just breaking it out, like the creation process, things like that. And just making sure that from an overall campaign strategy and the duration of it all, you're able to track, know what's going out when and making sure that it's on a good cadence. And then that way the next month you can kind of keep on that same flow too. So a big um, thing that we like to recommend here is it can get a little confusing if one month you're sending out eight emails and then you go ghost for two months and then the next month you send out three and then you go ghost. You wanna keep sure that that's consistent. So consistency is gonna be huge throughout <clears throat> Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to be running a massive sale all 12 months, but just keeping that communication with your audience consistent so then, then they know that they are going to be expecting an email from you or if they haven't heard from you, they're not like, did this business go out of business? You know, what is what's going on? Mm -hmm. It's also um, that that thing you mentioned about 
too little also is major. Like, whereas way too many times where someone doesn't use their email list, doesn't send out an email for like two or three months, and then they do finally send out an email and it does horrible. And they go, well, this is why I don't send them very often. Like, no, 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 no. It's horrible because you don't send them enough. People right. don't remember who you are. I don't remember what I did two days ago. I'm right. not going to remember someone I shopped with two months ago. And if they start emailing me now, I'm gonna be like, I don't know who this is. And I'm going to unsubscribe. So you have to find that nice balance of staying in their inbox enough and not staying in there too much, but not staying in there too little as well. <laughs> and you also notice down here for one of the examples we had, um, this was a, someone we worked with where we're doing some stuff for Prime Day. And you'll see the one we've got there for email number one. It was a retry. And so what we actually like to do is you'll send out your campaign, wait, what, usually like 48 hours, give or take, I think is what yeah. we wait, right? Oh. So about 48 hours, you create another audience of people who didn't open the original email. If they opened it, they saw it, you don't want to bother them again, but it could have just been bad timing. You should A-B test time of day, you should A-B test time, uh, day of the week, that kind of stuff. But sometimes it's not going to be perfect for everyone. So you can actually see we did an open rate. This open rate was at a 75.8%. We created another email two days later that went to just the people that didn't open it. And then that one got a 70, almost a 73%. So that open rate was just because they didn't see it at the time and they missed it. So now we're trying a different time to try to get them for a different day. Try not to do that too many times in a row because usually we have another campaign coming up right behind it. But it is a very, very interesting approach to be able to take the exact same email you already created and just attempt to hit that audience again. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so campaign, uh, campaign cadence, we really suggest doing at least four a month, especially if you're doing some kind of sale or anything around those lines. So doing one a week, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, is usually what we would suggest from a minimum. I would also say like, if we really had to get a little iffy on it, bare, bare minimum, do one every other week, do two a month. But one a month is probably not gonna be enough for anything. Uh, so it's something to consider. Usually if you're doing a big campaign, you wanna do more. But what you don't wanna do is you don't wanna be a company that's known for sending out an email on a very rare occasion. And then something like Q4 rolls around and you send out 500 of them. If you can actually develop consistency of you should expect an email from us on this day at this time once you figure out what your audience really likes that way they know it's coming they can expect it it's not too much because they know it's coming they get used to it and then you stay in their inbox a lot more so it's just about remaining consistent um <clears throat> this is obviously an awesome example we had of someone we worked with uh, the client of ours, MD Glam. I mean, the results we were getting from them was nuts. It was all from this stuff that we put in place. How often are we emailing them? Are we trying out retries? Are we emailing them too much? Are we emailing them too little? Is it consistent? Is it the same day of the week, different day of the week, different day, different time? Um, so all these are really quick and painless ways to actually turn your campaigns around and really start to bring in some nice results. And we were able to prove that. So of course we were gonna put it on here and be like, yo, check it out. Uh, same thing from the SMS side. 14% uh, conversion rate for anything would be awesome. You think about like a website's conversion rate. I hate, you know, I was thinking about when, we, when I was going through these slides, I was like 14% conversion rate is awesome, but just that little tiny blue thing makes it look not so awesome. However, <laughs> if you factor in the fact that the average e-commerce uh, website has a 2%, maybe on a high end of 4% conversion rate, if you could get anything to convert at 14%, pour gas on it except SMS. SMS is one of those things where you get really nice results. And if you do it right, you'll continue to get nice results, but don't get greedy. SMS and email is one of those things that if it starts to do really well, which it should, if you get greedy, it will actually start to hurt you because you're going to annoy the shit out of people. They're going to unsubscribe. They're going to yell at you through text message and keep texting you to stop. It becomes a whole thing. So be very, very careful with those. Best practices, A-B testing, big, big thing. A-B testing is something that is oddly incredibly underutilized. I never really understood why because it's so easy to put together really on any platform. Within Klaviyo, it's a button. You just hit a button, then you select what you want to A-B test. We always suggest A-B testing subject lines. 
do a bunch of them when you're A-B testing subject lines. See what kind of subject works really well. Does it have emojis? Does it not have emojis? Is it playful? Is it mean? Is it like, there's a ton of different ways you can go with it. CTAs, button colors. Very straightforward. A-B test, that kind of stuff. Longer copy, short form copy. You get a little bit more into like designing several emails with that. Subject lines is a really easy one. Time of day, time of week, that kind of stuff. Super basic, very easy. You just clone it and then just try two different things. And it'll tell you which one's working. Obviously, in this case, we were A-B testing subject lines. And it turns out everyone wanted a dad joke for that example. Uh, so obviously, that one started to see a better open rate. Usually, we do 20% of the list, right? Yep. More than that, 20? 20%. So we usually do 20% of the list. So it'll send to 20%. Uh, 10% gets one subject line, 10% gets the other. It waits four hours, six hours. You can set the duration. Um, okay, so yeah. Typically, do you have a suggestion? Is, I would do three to four hours, typically, actually. But you can so do three, Yeah. So three to four hours, you wait, and then it sends the rest of the email, obviously, to whichever subject line did the best. Yep. Um, you want to take this one? Sure. Yeah. So typically for A-B testing, um, sort of what, um, like Andrew said as well, def definitely because it sets the duration of it, you want to be able to test different results based off of um, whatever is performing best. So if we're going to use subject lines, for, ex for example, let's just say you're doing one with emojis, one not with emojis. If you have a clear winner of everyone likes emojis, I would say maybe run that for two weeks, especially if you're doing like four a month or more than four a month, run them for two weeks. If it's clear winners every single time, I would say just run with that data and just you know keep going with the emojis and then test a different variation from there. But in some cases, they're really close. So it's like one gets a 25% open rate and another one gets a 24.8% open rate. And so they're really, really close. And from there, what I recommend to do is kind of switch up both variations. So if they're pretty indifferent between emojis or not using emojis, switch up the copy with the emojis, you know? So then you're gonna play a little bit more with the tone of voice, or you could even go a different route. So keep them both, you know, A-B testing since they're relatively the same, but then also look at maybe is it the, the time of day. And so from there, I wouldn't recommend dabbling major with double testing and doing multiple tests at the same time. However, if they are relatively close, I think from that perspective, you want to try to see what it is that's maybe going to differentiate a little bit more just to get that extra boost. Yeah. Um, I would say, especially even if there is a clear winner, sorry, I do have a kitten and she's jumping on me right now. Um, even if there is a clear winner, you do want to optimize it every few months just to make sure that, you know, you can, because everything can obviously always be optimized. And so, from that perspective, you want to, as you're getting new list members in, as you're getting new audiences in, just check to see if that emoji is still the way to go, try a different route, and then just obviously build from there. This is our last section, email best practices. Uh, so growing your list, tools to use, obviously pop-ups, newsletter signups, skated content cross cross-channel cross stuff, very, very straightforward and obvious. It's really what you're offering is what becomes very interesting. And there's a billion things you could really think of. So from a gated content standpoint, you've got white papers, eBooks, webinars, uh, you've got uh, discounts, obviously you can do stuff like that. Um, calendars I've seen done really well, uh, live events to attend. Like there's so many things that you can do from a perspective of intriguing someone to give you their email. Um, in fact, again, we were talking about this earlier. Someone's doing, I was working with someone who's doing free samples. Great way to just get emails, get some stuff out, spend a couple bucks on sending them a product. And honestly, at how low they're getting emails from that really works really well. Obviously, this is all stuff that you could do directly on your site. But then you factor in, do you want to do uh, lead form ads on Facebook and get an email that way? Do you want to do um, lead form ads on Google and do them that way? You could also get really really creative with it there are big email lists out there or big newsletters out there that you can sponsor and have them you know have some offer on that newsletter and then they come over and sign up with you 
there's tons of things that you can do from a sponsorship perspective of then offering your gated content on other channels that actually brings over a lot more. The other thing to do, which I actually really like doing, is finding a company that is complementary to you, but not competitive. So let's say, um, let's say you're big in fishing and your whole product line is in fishing stuff. And then you actually reach out to a company that has, let's say an email list that's maybe equal or maybe a little bit bigger ideally. And they're doing all hunting stuff. Two really similar things. It just happens to be that obviously you're focused on fish, they're focused on land, right? So you can actually partner with them and do a swap where you basically say, hey, you send out an email offering your list subscribers a discount to our store and we will do the same for you. It's a great way to actually get someone else's customers to come shop with you. Or you can do it the other way where you have some kind of gated content be like, hey, we want to offer this to your subscribers. And if you have anything you want to offer, we'll offer it to our subscribers. So it's a weird, interesting way of doing like partnership stuff with other businesses that are complementary, that have the same or similar audience that just aren't competitive. Um, tools to use. There's multi-step stuff. Obviously, you've got forums. You've got a ton of different pop-ups out there. Pop-ups are tend to be the great way to do this because they come to the site. It's like the first thing they see. Pop-ups are obnoxious sometimes so you've got to be really careful let them be on the site for a little bit before you shove a giant thing in front of their face if it's on mobile make sure it's very small or if it like pops from the top or the bottom or something like that don't have it be a full screen thing um i know i'm sure there's probably someone watching this right now who's got one of those spinny things uh that privy's got where like you can hit a discount like those things are huge so you really want to try and ease into the pop-up remember this whole concept, this whole conversation we're having right now is about growing your list and improving your email marketing, but you still have to factor in the overall experience on your website. You don't want to diminish that. So you don't want to have a ton of obnoxious pop-ups. You have your initial pop-up that should be relatively personalized as much as you can. You can do it based on where they came from, based on uh, who they are, if you already know something about them. Then maybe you want to have an exit intent. So if they're going to leave and they haven't taken an action, you want to have a pop-up. Otherwise, slow down don't overdo the pop-ups there's been countless sites i've been on where there's like five of them and it's incredibly annoying so ease up on those because otherwise you're actually going to hurt the overall experience it'll hurt the conversion rate on your website uh additional email functionalities we talked about so different like campaigns you, we always have this stereotypical stuff right okay here's a discount here's it's father's day or whatever here's a thing that kind of stuff there's other things you can do to provide value and to keep them interested. Obviously, I mentioned partnering with other businesses. Hannah's got a great list here of like roundup emails. Did you do a ton of blogs that are about a very specific topic? Just do a whole thing on like, hey, here's a great, here's some reading material for you that would be very interesting based on what you're interested in, right? Or newsletters, very clear, but it's like some new stuff. Hey, here's what's going on. Here's some stuff that's relevant to the industry. I know from a B2B perspective, like for someone like us, that's very easy. I could send out an email every day. In fact, we do uh, every week about all the stuff going on in the e-commerce industry, right? Well, if you're, I don't know why, I always do fishing and I don't fish. If you're into, if you're into fishing for whatever reason, if you're into fishing and you want to talk about like, hey, there's something crazy going on with some kind of fish or there's a great fishing tournaments going on or something like just news about the industry you can think of outside of just selling product where it can make it a lot more interesting for them to open your email because they don't know what's going to be in it. So they want to open it and be interested by what's there. You have your latest articles, you could have events going on, seasonal stuff, testimonials are always great. UGC, if you get featured by some really cool uh, uh, influencer or maybe you have a video go viral or something, like tell everyone about it. Why not? I miss anything? No, I think you covered most of it, yeah. Got him. All right. You want to take this one? Yeah, so a big thing with kind of like what we talked about is beyond conversion, there's always kind of that secondary goal that you want to make sure that you have established. And that'll help, help to set the tone, especially when maybe you are a little bit lighter on promotions for a month, but you still want to keep that consistency in place. You can pretty much determine the direction and the targeting that you are wanting to do to obviously 
retain your customers, get in, educate your customers, get in contact to keep that relevancy. So that way, when the time comes again, we've got a great promotion or when they're ready to buy again, you're the first person that comes to mind. And so from that perspective, you can do a couple of different things. So by using you know, these newsletters, these events, UGC, what we just talked about, first of all, you can solidify yourself as the thought leader in the space. So you're you're the one that's kind of educating. They know that even on a monthly basis that they can expect the latest, greatest news events, things like that. They're automatically going to associate that with you. Two, it helps to build that trust, maintains that consistency. It educates in, in some aspects. So especially if you're utilizing blogs or events or anything like that, you're giving them something, you know, in addition to um, a sale, especially if you're not running it. Um, it helps obviously with segmentation and audiences. So one, it'll help with that engagement. So that engage 90, things like that. And you can also break them out a little bit too. So if you are running events to go on your example, a fishing exp you know, expedition, you can segment those people, <laughs> you know, from that fishing expedition and then target them later on be like, Hey, thank you so much for, you know, coming to our fishing event. You know, here's the latest on everything bluegill i don't know yeah. i'm from wisconsin but i don't <laughs> fish either so it's fine <laughs> and then lastly obviously it improves seo too so yes it does <laughs> it does improve seo and everyone who's on here that says it doesn't is wrong so i'm gonna make something this one I, I was waiting for this one so okay this is a big one this isn't an seo webinar that was last month so i'm gonna touch on this really quick there's so many people that implement a ton of really good SEO strategies and then do nothing to promote the SEO stuff that they're doing, typically the content. And because of that, it takes that much longer for it to actually make any traction. So for example, if you were to write a ton of blogs and you were to just publish them on your website, no matter how great the keywords are, no matter how many backlinks you get, that kind of stuff, it will take a while for those to start to gain traction. Because really what happens is the way that Google starts to realize like, oh, there's people that are actually interested in this. Let's start to show it more and more is because people start showing up to it. Well, if you just publish it and not a lot of people show up to it, it takes that much longer for it to start to show up. But if you publish an article, send out an email to your big old email list and they all go over and start reading it, Google goes, oh shit, this is getting a ton of traffic. Let's increase it based on the keywords that you're targeting. So by having kind of like a roundup article newsletter approach, you're not only keeping your email marketing consistent and keeping those open rates and that value going, but you're actually improving your SEO too. Marketing is all connected. I love that one so much. Sorry. Um, AI. Yay. Why? We can't, we can't do a webinar without talking about AI, right? I'm going to die. Anyway, AI stuff, Jasper, ChatGPT, Right Sonic, Frazy. There's a ton of stuff out there that will help you come up with some really cool subject lines or copy or personalization. There's a ton of them out there. Honestly, from an email marketing perspective, if you're doing a roundup where you're kind of like taking an article and, or several articles and giving a bunch of information, this could be very beneficial because it can help you speed up the copy process. Otherwise, subject lines, copy, especially if you're doing a campaign, should be quick to the point. What are you offering? Why do I want it? That's about it. Something to catch their eye from a subject line or from the snippet. So it'll help you kind of come up with some ideas. So there's a ton of stuff out there that you can obviously use. We did it. We made it. We made it. Right at our, right at our time. <laughs> so obviously we went through all the technical stuff. We went through the segmentation. We went through the audit emails. We went through SMS. We went through the calendar. We went through cadence. We went through A-B testing, how to grow your email list. And I think I'm, I'm going to need a nap after this one. Webinars are exhausting because I just got to sprint through everything and I start thinking of stuff. Great. Went through a it lot. It might also be that energy drink. It might also be the energy drink. Um, but we went through a lot today. Went through everything that we could think of. Obviously, there's us. Um, don't worry. You won't have to work with me. Hannah will. Hannah's the better one here. Uh, so obviously, here at Blue Tusker, as a full service marketing company, we do a lot on the retention marketing side a uh, ton of different emails on pretty much any platform you can think of. If anything here today was super interesting to you, you know where to find us. Um, but got to give everything away, right? So we have a retention marketing schedule and weekly data strategy spreadsheet thing that we use. I have just put it in the chat for everyone. You have view access. It is a Google sheet. You can go to file, 
copy and then it's all yours and you can use it yourself. We use that to map out our calendar of all of our campaigns and start to look at um, time of day, what we were testing, subject lines, uh, what the goal was, what the results were, copy, creative, all that fun stuff. And then there's also a week over week tracking for campaigns and automation. Uh, if you have something like a super metrics or anything that can connect directly to that Google sheet, you could automate it. Uh, otherwise, you could also just go in once a week and fill it out, have a VA do it. Um, great way to keep an eye on all of your email marketing and be able to track everything. And then of course the audit. So we've got a couple audits that we're gonna give away. And if you are interested in an email marketing audit, all you have to do is shoot me an email. I just put my email in the chat. Take my email, shoot me an email and say that you are interested in email marketing audit and that you joined today. And I will gladly add you all to our list. And then I'm gonna just pull a couple names out of a hat. Uh, actually, there's a randomizer I use online. We're gonna use that guy. Uh, and then we're gonna pick our two favorite people. And that was our, our event. Thank you all for joining us. Hannah, did you have a good time? I did, thank you. Did I, I hope you had a good again? time. I think I talked too much again. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe okay. next time I'll have a, a, a energy drink like an hour before we start it and I'll get it on the back end. Maybe just do like a quick run around the block. <laughs> learn how to fish. Yes, so that it's more relevant. More relevant. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. It was awesome. That was a good one. Really enjoyed it. If you've got questions, comments, or concerns, if you have questions or comments, feel free to shoot me an email, andrew at bluetusker.com. If you've got concerns, tough. Uh, but thank you all for joining us. <laughs> really appreciated it. Uh, Maria, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for joining us. And we will see you all next time. Have a good week. Bye.